This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day, and welcome to IAQ Radio. It's Friday, January 19th, 2018. I'm on the road this week at the Sloan uh, Research to Practice Conference, and then I'll be headed over to the IAQA Conference and reporting live back next week. And we'll be in our new format next week, so it'll be more like a webinar, and hopefully listeners will enjoy that. Uh, We picked out a great show for you this week to flash back to Dr. Tina Raponin, and uh, this show was in early 2017 on the microbiome of the built environment. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this one. And we'll be back live next Friday at noon. IAQ Radio marquee sponsors are John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at IAQ.net. Legends Environmental Insurance, the experts in insurance for environmental consultants and contractors for over 20 years at legends-enviro.com. That's legends-enviro.com. Please be sure to thank our sponsors for their support of IAQ Radio when you inquire about their services or products. And last but not least, please visit the IAQ Training Institute website for the most current dates for the training you trust at iaqtraining.com. You can also learn more about this year's Healthy Building Summit 2017 at that same site. All right, let's turn it over to the Z-Man for today's IAQ Radio trivia question. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everybody. I'm sorry to report... There was no correct answer to last week's IQ Radio Trivia Question. The IQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, March 24, 2017, has been sponsored by Ideas, the solution chemistry company, creating unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Now for today's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Name the U.S. government agency that is promoting productive workplaces through safety and health research. Back to you, Joe. Thank you, Cliff. This week, we're happy to welcome Dr. Tina Raponin. She's a professor at the Department of Environmental Health College of Medicine at the University of Cincinnati. She is the director of a NIOSH-funded University of Cincinnati Education and Research Center, which includes graduate programs related to occupational health from three colleges, the Medicine, Nursing, Applied Science, and Engineering Colleges. She has been currently directing two cohort studies, one of which is focused on the association between indoor bioaerosol exposure and the development of children's allergy and asthma, and the other is focused on the effects of green renovation on indoor air quality and occupants' health. She's got a long history of of just wonderful research that we look forward to talking to her more about. Dr. Raponin, do we have you on the line? Oh, thanks for inviting me. And we, good uh, afternoon, everyone. This, we we want to uh, start with some of, you know, a little background on, on what goes on at the University of Cincinnati. Can you tell listeners a little bit about what the program is? Is it fully a NIOSH-funded program, or are you a little bit of both? A um, little bit of both. Uh, there are NIOS funding, funding from Housing and Urban Development, funding from National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So um, I have, as a professor, I'm teaching. I'm teaching industrial hygiene students in a graduate program, which includes, uh, of course, coursework, te- teaching courses, but also advising them with master's and PhD uh, thesis. And uh, so the Education and Research Center that is funding the stipends for, for the students, that's NIOS funded. Uh, my research then has 
um, different funding agencies. I have public health uh, research. That is, um, I have uh, had quite a lot of funding from Housing and Urban Development and National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, and that's mostly focused on particles and bioaerosols. Mostly my role has been exposure assessment in the studies. And then the occupational health studies are, are mainly funded by NIOS, also some industry funding. Um, and uh, I guess we're going to talk about the studies later. Just mention some few, few things that I've done in occupational environments. Looked at um, agricultural workers' exposure to bioaerosols, um, bioaerosols in metal working fluid environments, and uh, did, uh, we did firefighters uh, the past five years in the Education and Research Center. We focused on firefighters, health and safety, and right now we have focus on home healthcare workers, health and safety. And that comes, of course, close to the indoor air quality that we are talking today. So that's a short introduction. Well, you know, that's interesting to me. With respect to the industrial hygiene students, um, are you seeing an increase in the number of people in that type of program, a decrease? Is it about the same? Um, well, we um, it kind of fluctuates from year to year, and uh, I think it's been staying this, about the same in the past. And it, it is thanks to the funding that we have from NIOS that we've been able to attract uh, students to this program because they get stipends. Uh, uh, okay, that helps. I have a good friend who, who um, worked at the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public Health, and and that back in the day, when he, we're talking the 70s, there were stipends that people didn't even use. Uh, there was, you know, more available than people used because it was so new and, 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 a, and a growing kind of thing that people weren't aware of. How did you get involved with indoor air quality type work and, and bioaerosols and particles? Well, this goes back to my time in Finland. I did my master's um, actually all my schooling was in Finland so actually started my master's thesis was indoor air quality assessment in a general terms we looked at several different components on on indoor environments uh, in buildings that had different stru structures uh, one wooden structure and then one brick structure and then that led to my PhD study where we um, looked at indoor air quality in homes that have different ventilation systems and at that point I uh, most, most was most focused on bioaerosols, bacteria, and fungi. So that kind of started my interest in in the bioaerosol area. But I also, I, my advisor in Finland was an aerosol scientist, so I have a quite strong aerosol background. Okay. Also. And you, you've done, we're going to talk a little bit too about some of the work you did with um, particulate after fires. I think that's very interesting. To, a lot of our listeners are in the restoration world, and Cliff and I are always interested in any good research we can find on exposure to that. But before we do, let's talk a little bit more about the bioaerosols, mold, bacteria, pollen, all, all of that. Um, you, you've done a lot of work in that area, and, and I'm wondering if, if, from your perspective, do we focus too much on mold, or, or should we be looking more at the microbial soup, all the different components within these water-damaged buildings? Well, one, one thing definitely needs to, needs to be included is bacteria. So bacteria, there are several bacteria, for example, actinomycetes, that, that uh, can, have, uh, can be potentially very uh, biologically active. So, so I think that at least the bacteria should be included. And we still don't, I mean, there's still this question on what is it in the, in the moisture-damaged buildings that causes the health effects. So there is potentially other exposures there too. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking there are kind of two different questions when I am approaching it from the point of view that I'm interested in learning the exposures and the consequent health, health effects. But for those people who do restoration, uh, for them, uh, it is enough to know what is the, the best surrogate that you know that there's a problem in the building. So they don't necessarily need to go so deeply if they are just trying to find out if there's a problem, moisture problem or not in the building. And mold is the best so surrogate. A, well, mold, and I would say bacteria also. Sometimes you, you could have bacteria and not necessarily see, seeing that, that high elevated concentrations of mold. So 
gram-negative bacteria and um, actinomyces. I would I would uh, look at those two. When you when you say that you know we're still not sure what it is about these water damaged buildings that cause health effects. We're you know for a while people focused on mycotoxins and then I know NIOSH had some stuff on beta glucans and and there's other theories. What do you what are your thoughts on that? Where where should we be focusing more of our attention on? It sounds like maybe the bacteria and the actinomyces, which I've heard more of lately. Well, um, well, I, maybe I will just now say what, what, what we have seen in our studies when we use different methods to assess um, the, the mold and then look at the consequent health effects. Um, We've, we saw, as many, many other researchers have seen, that the visible mold is, is one, one good indicator. So if you have visible mold and especially moldy odor, there is more um, adverse health effects. Um, but when we, uh, in this, we had the longitudinal birth cohort study in, in Cincinnati, and when we looked at, uh, at different time points, we saw that the visible mold was, uh, most strongly associated early in life. So if, if the child had visible mold early in life, they also were more likely to have wheezing and rhinitis up to age three. But then the longer term effect, um, we were able to show an association only when we used the PCR-based assessment of mold. Uh, so this is the EPA-developed uh, molecular uh, mold-specific PCR assay. And, and when we used that method, we saw that if the child has high, had high mold early in life, which means before age one, uh, they were more likely to develop asthma later in life. And uh, we did not see that association with other methods. We looked at beta-glucan, we looked at endotoxin, um, we looked at uh, dust samples, air samples, we did mold, microscopic counting of mold and then the visible mold. So as I said, visible mold was associated early in life, but not anymore later in life. So um, I, I, I um, would advocate uh, to use several methods, first of all, and I think that the new molecular biological methods, they do have some promise, at least we have seen those, those in our studies, the, the associations with those methods. Were, were there any specific types of mold that appeared to have more of a uh, uh, association with these types of asthma, wheezing, etc., health effects than others? Um, well, we, we looked at uh, 36 different species, and out of those 36 species, we the strongest association was with three species. Two of them were Aspergillus, and one was Penicillium. Hmm. Uh, and then also others have shown, other studies uh, that used culture-based assessment have also shown associations with cross-sectional studies with the penicillium. So based on that, it seems that there could be some species that are more strongly associated, especially if we're thinking about asthma. This was asthma was the outcome that we looked in, in here. And this was the development of asthma, not the exacerbation, or was it both? Uh, development of asthma. We had um, the ch children were assessed each year by a physician and, and looked if they had developed asthma or not. And at age seven, uh, the, the asthma development was associated with the early exposure. So it was asthma development. Hmm. And do you, do you feel like we're Almost to the point, you know, I know in the last, I think, World Health Organization study on the issue, it was still that mold was associated with uh, the development of asthma. Do you think we're getting closer to finding that it, it could be caused by? Well, I think there is a one review out um, that already re concluded that uh, the observed mold and moisture has causal association. They felt that there was enough epidemiological evidence uh, to show that the observed damage as is, has causal association, but still the measured mold and, and asthma uh, development, that has, that there is more controversial results, and, and I don't know if I want to complicate this, but we have 
actually in our studies have seen with certain components when we measure the beta glucan, which is a cell wall component of, of fungi, we, we actually saw inverse association. And this was with wheezing, in was inverse association with wheezing. And others have also shown with endotoxin and beta glucan that um, if there's a higher exposure, there could be actually less uh, respiratory health outcomes. Wow. So measured mold is there's still a lot of open questions. And when you say when you say measured mold, this is using culture based uh, types of, of uh, I mean any yeah, I I mean any type of measurement. So culture based, uh, microscopic counting, using the beta glucan, um, endotoxin um, what else has been used? Yeah, um, so in, anything the, that gives you quantitative results. And then what I mean with observed mold is that you're using your eyes and your nose. So what you see and what you smell. I see. Very interesting. And, and you've, you've also looked at, well, I want to get back to um, a little bit on the, the exposure assessment because a lot of our people do exposure they don't necessarily do exposure assessments but they do building assessments so they're looking at buildings and trying to find the moisture sources and then they're trying to determine how much of a you know obviously when you go in you inspect the building people want to know is it is it a problem is is it something that we need we need to address and how do we address it and i'm wondering what your thoughts are on the use of the molecular types of analysis for evaluating whether the building has problems, not necessarily whether the people are going to have health effects? Um, well, I have to say I have not used that for building investigations. So my investigations have focused on, on always with the epidemiological studies to you look, it, look at as, at, as a um, to assess exposure and then look at health effects. But we did compare side by side when we did compare the, um, the, the microscopic counting, the PCR assay and uh, beta glucan and the toxin, and then we had the visible assessment. It was interesting that um, none of them were not necessarily very well correlated with the visible because many, many instances you don't necessarily have everything uh, visible to the naked eye, it could be behind the structures. But the mold, moldy smell, moldy smell was associated with the PCR-based assay quite, quite strongly. Hmm. So, um, so that again um, give, gives indication that there might be something with the PCR-based assay. But the new, newer molecular-based uh, methods, the microbiome and sequencing, uh, those are developing very fast, but there needs to be more, um, let's say, background data before those can be u- really used by practitioners in building investigations. And we were talking a little before the show about some of the work that uh, Dr. Mark Hernandez has done, and, and they're using, I don't, I don't want to get the wrong term, like a biofluorescence. Um, they're doing particle counts, and then they're they're using uh, biofluorescence to differentiate between the fungi and the bacteria, and then I guess other um, uh, pollen, etc. Have you? What are your thoughts on that technique? Um, yeah, I am familiar with that. I actually collaborated with a Finnish a group that developed a similar but more si- simple device, BioScout, uh, Tampere, Tampere University of Technology. So I'm. Um, kind of familiar with that technique, and uh, I think it has some promise because it gives you instant reading, and um, I'm actually looking forward to to getting that instrument uh, soon and starting to, to try it out with my in my studies. So you say there's another. I think, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, quite, I, well, there, I, I lost my thoughts. You were saying there was another similar instrument that was developed in, in Europe. Is that Did I get that right? Yeah, there, there are actually um, there are several other instruments. The UV APS by TSA was, TSI was the first one that was developed in, I think the first one that was developed in USA. 
and then um, uh, then that instrument in Tampere University of Technology, and there are a couple of others that uh, basically have only like one wavelength for the excitation and one wavelength for emission. The, the one that um, you had in your radio is a little bit more sophisticated, has several different wavelengths, uh, and, and gives the ability to differentiate different types of biological particles. And I guess what, what I'd like to do is just offer that when, when you've had a chance to play with that instrument a little bit more, we'd like to get you back and, and see what your thoughts are, because some people feel like that could be a major shift in the way we investigate buildings. It's expensive. I mean, we're looking at probably $35,000, but you could, like you said, you can, you can do a lot more with it, and, and you can take a lot more samples, which is really, I think, another uh, thing that really differentiates it. You know, you can take uh, a bunch of spore traps or culture samples, but then you've got to wait, you know, several days or, or whatever to get the results back. With that instrument, you're you're talking about a lot of samples pretty quickly and then a, a immediate turnaround on the results. So it should be interesting. We'll follow up with you when you've had chi- a little time to play yeah. with that one. Yeah, I, I, I'd be happy to. I um, just thinking, I don't know if you're going to, we, we're going to get to the respiratory protection, but I was thinking that something like that instrument that gives you already some in instant reading and then you know if you need to imp- <laughs> protect yourself better or isolate the area better so it gives you immediately uh, right. more information than what you can get from sampling and analysis. I, I do want to get to the respiratory protection. I've got one other, two other questions first because I was happy to see how much you've done on respiratory protection. I didn't realize how much information there was within the studies you've done. But b- before we do, let's let's talk about filtration in, in general. Um, filtration of, of microbial contamination and, and fragments and so on. I think first I want to clarify with listeners, when we talk about HEPA filtration uh, at 0.3 micrometers, what about the smaller particles that are smaller than 0.3 micrometers? Do these also get filtered out by a HEPA filter? Yeah, so filters, their efficiency is, um, if you're familiar with the collection efficiency curves, it's a U-shaped curve. So when they say that HEPA has 99.99% efficiency, that is the minimum efficiency, and that's typically for 0.3 micrometer particles. So the smaller and larger particles are collected more efficiently. So the 99.99 is, is minimum efficiency in that most penetrating particle size. Got it. And then I want to talk a little bit about fragments of microbial growth. I see that you've also done some work on that, and I'm wondering, there are some who feel that maybe it's the fragments of fungi and, I guess, bacteria and other things that that maybe causing some of these health effects as opposed to the whole, you know, the whole spore, et cetera. What are your thoughts on that? Well, that's my favorite topic. (laughs) (laughs) I have have to take some credit on that. I I think we were among the first ones who showed uh, when we were looking at the release of fungal particles, we were interested in seeing how they are released and what velocity you need and how they are released from different types of building materials, and we used the particle, or regular particle counters, to look at the, what was released. And we saw on the kind of very far left side this additional peak. And initially, we thought that's like an maybe it's a malfunctioning of the instrument. But then started looking to, to it closer, and and then we're able to show that they actually are fungal particles. At least some of them are fungal particles. And then later, like. Over the years, we come back to that topic, and most recently, I collaborated with the Finnish group, and, and they, they used scanning electron microscopy with some elemental analysis and showed that um, some of these particles do come from the mat- material itself. When the fungi is growing on the material, they are digesting it because using it as a substrate for growth, they're digesting that material. But then also when the fungal structure dries out and if there's any air currents or vibration, then these particles are released into the air and it's a mixture of the building material plus the fungi. Hmm. So it is an, an exposure that is 
um, often, often overlooked. And uh, because these particles, you, you wouldn't see them with the traditional methods for cultivation or microscopic counting, you would not, not necessarily differentiate them. And um, they, they, because they are smaller, they can stay in the air longer. Uh, so that gives more chances for people to get exposed to that versus fungal spores that can deposit in a few hours from the air. They also can be transported efficiently with air currents to adjacent areas, and then depositing deeper in the respiratory tracts, so causing different types of health effects than the spores. And then again, the other thing is how do they behave in the control devices? So if it happens to be then the 0.3 micrometer, which is the minimum efficiency for many, many filter type devices, then they would be less efficiently um, filtered out than, than the intact spores. So yeah, I, I do think that um, this is an exposure that um, needs to be kept in mind when thinking about how people are exposed in moldy buildings. Well, to go a little deeper on that subject, a lot of people out here doing investigation and remediation obviously can't afford to do the type of analysis that you know you can do in studies um, on that particular topic, the fragments of, of growth. So I'm wondering, have you seen any correlation? Do, do buildings with visible mold have higher numbers of these fragments than buildings without visible mold? Um, does it correlate maybe to spore trap sampling or culturable sampling? Anything you can tell listeners about that? Mm. Well, it is interesting that the, we have not had very extensive field studies, but the field studies that we have done show that there really is no correlation. So you, the fragment and spore counts, for example, they don't correlate, and they don't correlate with visible mold. We actually had um, so highest concentration of fragments in homes that had uh, very little visible mold and, and during winter time, when the air was dry and we had quite low spore counts, and that's when we saw higher fragment counts. Hmm. So, unfortunately, uh, it does not seem that you can use a surrogate uh, to assess those. So, so that's kind of also keeping in mind. So, if you only see a little bit of mold, then it doesn't guarantee that that that, that there is less problems. So, you need to keep that that in mind. Also, the fragments can also penetrate through the cracks into the environment easier easier than the intact spores. And was there any correlation with odor? Um. I don't think we had the odor at that point. This was done um, at the time when we did not yet pay attention to the odor, Okay. unfortunately. Okay, and I've got a, a text question from a listener. Um, they ask, how small is a fungal cell containing DNA? Um, well, well, the fungal cell itself, we have spores and we have mycelium. So the spores are typically from two micrometers and up. Um, I, I don't know if it's not well known what is the minimum unit where you still would have the DNA in, intact. But way back when we tried to use the molecular biological methods for fragments, we were not able to detect fungal DNA. So my best guess is that it, you need to have that intact um, in that cell, which is two micrometers and up. For the, for the second half, I, I want to come back and talk a little bit more about the respiratory protection, and also we have some questions. We found some research you did on vacuum cleaners. So before we go to halftime, I do want to ask at least one more question on microbial issues, and, and that is that you know, you've been studying indoor environmental quality, mold, microbial issues for, for many years now. What has your research shown that has surprised you? Well, um, there are small, small um, surprises pretty much all the time. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would say, like, which is like high, highlighting, and that's the interest why I keep on doing this. Um, so I, I think the fragments was was uh, the first one. I kind of a big 
discovery. And uh, at this that point, when we saw that there was not much, it was not much looked at that point. So I think that was one one issue. And then I would say the other one that I already mentioned was the protective effect. So that we seeing seeing this kind of dual effect that certain mold components are increasing the risk of adverse health effects, but then at certain conditions, certain genetic makeup of, 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 the, of the person who is exposed, it could also have an inverse meaning protective effect, and that's been seen with the beta glucan and endotoxin. So I think those, I would highlight those two as big surprises for me. Let me follow up by asking this real quick. What are your thoughts on, on the hygiene hypothesis? Um, I think there is some truth into into it. Uh, so that's the that if you are exposed early in life, then you develop develop ADOP allergy le- less if you uh, you develop the, uh, uh, with with, with uh, microbial and also like endotoxin and beta glucan. We have seen that in our our study, and um, so I, I do believe that there is some truth into it. So there's there's a fine line there, though, I guess, because, you know, you want some exposure when you're young, but on the other hand, your research shows that some at least types of exposure can lead to really nasty type issues like asthma. Yes, so <laughs> that that is, and I, I'm not... I'm not a medical doctor, and I'm not starting to prescribe people beta glucan or, or things things like that. But I think the immunotherapy is is currently the medical doctors are using like little by little introducing certain certain allergen. Um, it's not yet used for mold, but some some food allergens, for example. So yeah, I recently uh, saw peanuts. They're they're actually starting to use uh, yeah. peanuts. Well, I think that's a good place to break for the first half we'll be back with dr tina raponin for the second half of our interview in 90 seconds we've got to stop and thank our sponsors iaq radio would like to thank our association sponsors the indoor air quality association a non-profit multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research visit them at iaqa.org Particles Plus, engineers and manufacturers feature rich particle counters, air quality monitoring, instrumentation, and vacuum pump technology. ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, who use advanced sensor software technology and embedded computers to provide superior environmental test instrumentation. Visit them. WolfSense.com. IAQ marquee sponsors are... John Don Products, where restoration and abatement contractors shop. Visit them at johndon.com. That's J-O-N-D-O-N.com. Healthy Indoor Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions are available at iaq.net. Legends Environmental Insurance, the experts in insurance for environmental consultants and contractors for over 20 years at legends-enviro.com. That's legends-enviro.com. Okay, Cliff, I want to turn it over to you to start the second half here. Thanks, Joe. Well, Doctor, thank you for joining us. And you know, as Joe had mentioned in the first half, um, a lot of the people that we teach and, and consult with have questions and concerns about respiratory protection. It seems to be uh, a subject that you know well and, and have studied. Um, so what I'd like to do is get your recommendations of respiratory protection for, I guess, first class would be workers removing microbial contaminated drywall after catastrophic flooding. So, you know, this would be some time after the, you know, the waters recede, you know, there's going to be fungal contamination, dust, uh, mud, uh, so on and so forth. What do you recommend for them? Well, um, let, let me start a little bit giving on what, 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 what is my background here. So I'm not by all means, I'm not <laughs> any expert in, in remediation, mold remediation. And I was involved, my respirator work has mainly dealt with um, looking at respirators. I've, I've looked at um, agricultural workers, respiratory protection, and then firefighters and, and several different types of uh, healthcare respirators. I was involved um, in a study that was done in New Orleans 
uh, after the hurricanes Katrina and Rita, where CDC was looking at the three different um, homes that were remediated, and we did something before, during, and after the remediation. And um, first of all, that study and some other studies have shown, of course, that during the remediation, the concentrations can increase 10, 100, even 1,000 times, three orders of magnitude uh, from the background. So this op obviously is a time when there are high exposures. Uh, we did have the workers wearing two different respirators. Uh, same worker was wearing um, morning another one and afternoon another one, and we measured with direct reading instruments on what, what, what was the workplace protection factor, so how much did it reduce the exposure. And we had N95 filtering face piece respirator and elastomeric half face piece respirator with N95 filter. And I, I don't know how, you, your, your listeners probably know about these respirators. Both of them yes. Yes. are as, assumed to, to in, decrease the exposure by 10 times. So if you use it properly, you are getting decrease of 10 times. And um, with the N95 filtering face piece respirator, this is a very small sample size. We had four subjects, but it only reduced five times. So not 10 times, but five times. Hmm. But with the elastomeric half face piece, when the same people were using an elastomeric, it, it decreased 40 times. Hmm. So, and we, we've seen a similar, similar trend with, um, when we did similar study in agricultural workers, that the, the elastomeric half face piece respirators performed better than the N95. So just to keep that in mind, when, when you are thinking about what is, because there are no guidelines for occupational exposure guidelines, so you cannot use the traditional way of deciding what respirator do you use. But um, first you look at the assigned protection factor, and then you know, like if you use a um, half face piece or filtering face piece, you get 10 times protection. But what our research has shown that very often the disposable filtering face piece respirators don't provide even 10 uh, protect, protection of 10. For some subjects, yes, they do, but, but overall, as an average, it was 10 or below, below 10. So that's, that's one thing to keep in mind. So um, I, that's because of that, I would almost recommend, if you look at the, there are guidelines by OSHA, EPA has guidelines for remediation workers, and they give, basically ask you to look at the, area of damage and then the likelihood of aerosolization, the exposure, and based on that, they give some recommendations. And the, and the smallest, the, the minimum is the N95, and it should be the NIOS certified respirator, so you know the performance. And then it goes by the more, more, more area and more likelihood of pro, uh, protection, it goes the highest was what they recommend is full face uh, respirator. Uh, for okay. for mold, remedi mold remediation, I believe this was also for the hurricane um, area. So, um, so I would look at that guidance and, if possible, kind of go a one step further, <laughs> knowing that uh, what is kind of believed to be the uh, protection factor might not be because during the time when the when the workers are working, they are moving, they they are getting sweaty the respirator might be moving on the face, um, so it does not necessarily provide the protection. And, and, and one thing before I forget to say, I want to say it's very important to have it um, properly fitted so that it fits the face. So no matter what kind of respirator you have, if it doesn't fit your face, then you're not going to get the protection that you, you would be expected. So it was kind of a long-winded question, but there's no one simple answer that take that, but I, I, would, I would say knowing that the exposures are very high and if the remediation workers go from one location to the next moldy homes, they are repeatedly exposed, so they should be concerned about their own exposures. Right. Um, one, of the, one of the reasons that we brought up the subject is that in many of the situations where there's catastrophic flooding, uh, homeowners cannot afford to have professional remediation done. You know, they end up doing it themselves. And, you know, it's difficult when money is tight to get these people to, you know, invest in 
respiratory protection. So it's something that, uh, you know, will help get the word out of how important it is. Uh, second well, question one, I have. One, one, uh, maybe I can ma- mention one, one uh, positive uh, um, kind of uh, <laughs> message here, like if, if they act quickly when the structures are still wet, there is less, less likelihood for aerosolization of anything out of it, because even if there is mold when it's wet, it's less likely to be aerosolized. So that's another kind of that do it quickly and, and, and if possible, wear the personal protective equipment. Sorry. Yeah, the one, yeah, the, one of the risks that concerns me the most would be um, remediation workers who get involved in dealing with bat guano or, or pigeon feces uh, or other bird feces, you know, in attics. Uh, could you comment uh, on that? Um, well, I, I, can, I am teaching this to the industrial hygiene students, so my, my background here is limited to what I'm reading from the literature, but this is relating to the mold uh, histoplasma capsulatum that is like uh, high protein uh, substrate. So the guano or pigeon feces have protein and that's, that's why those can be contaminated with histoplasma, uh, histoplasma capsulatum. And it's especially endemic in Ohio River Valley. So here in Cincinnati, we should be concerned about that. And because it, can, it is a fungus can, that can cause infections. So that's, um, I would think that's probably the reason why actually more stringent respiratory protection is recommended for that than, than for mold remediation. So actually, if you look at the uh, NIOS has guidelines for respiratory protection, and they recommend to use a um, powered air purifying respirator okay. with tight-fitting tight face piece. Uh, so either half mask or actually, I think, full, full face piece. Um, that assigned protection factor is 50 uh, in, instead of uh, lower, lower level. And especially if, if it's done in, in enclosed tight, tight quarters like attic, where you don't have a lot of ventilation and, and very small area where you are aerosolizing uh, when removing that. Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier in, in the first half that you had studied firefighters, and uh, I suspect that one of the reasons that you studied them was that I guess for many years they've had consistently higher levels of respiratory issues than other types of, than other types of workers. And, you know, the people in our industry end up going into these buildings shortly after, I mean, it can be minutes after the fire is suppressed, you know, sometimes hours, sometimes days, sometimes weeks or months after, depending on the level of damage. Uh, should there be a concern about exposure of remediation workers to particulate and polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons during demolition or cleaning of these buildings? Um, yeah, you brought a good point. I had not thought about that before, uh, but we, we have studied the firefighters, uh, both their exposure and then also their respiratory protection because they have two different types of health effects that have been, they are in increased risk. One is cancer, and that's uh, very likely related to the exposure to the uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, also phthalates, um, fire retardants that are coming from fire retardants, plastics, and also heart disease. So they have a combination of different issues going on, which is the exposure to ultrafine particles, exposure to cancer-causing agents and also heat stress and other other type of stress. So our uh, particle research was focused on looking at comparing the respirators, uh, how they perform against uh, combustion particles versus the traditional test particles. And what we have seen is that um, the traditional test particles uh, or let, let me take it other way, that the combustion particles penetrate more readily through the filter than the traditional test particles. And this was especially pronounced with plastic. When we burned plastic, that penetrated more readily through the N, N type of respirator. N means not resistant to oil. But when we used R and P type of respirators, we did not see a difference. 
So that's that's one thing that I could already now offer that if they go to uh, places that have had a fire damage, then not to use the N but use the R and P respirator first of all. Uh, if there's aerosolization of any of these co combustion parts. The other thing is that if there is there would, could be off casting of the the um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons phthalates and those are not ne necessary they would be mostly in vapor phase. Right. So they would need to use an um, respirator gas vapor cartridge in addition to the part particle respirator. So again then filtering phase this respirator would not work because you cannot put a gas vapor cartridge for that. So they would have to go at minimum of half uh, elastomeric half phase piece respirator and have an ROP. Yep. Joe, any follow-up? Uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I, I like that. No, I, what I'd like to do is get to this next topic. I mean, we could talk about that for another half hour, but um, I really want to ask about these vacuum cleaner questions. You, as Cliff picked up on this, I didn't see it, so... Um, he had a couple questions about the types of vacuum cleaners you had looked at, and I know it was a long time ago, and you actually had to go back and, and uh, probably review a little bit. What what type of research did you do on vacuum cleaners and the dust pickup on vacuum cleaners? Could you describe it for listeners? Okay, so this this was um, these studies were funded by Housing and Urban Development, and it was the time when. They were looking at methods to for uh, lead remediation, so how to clean up after the lead remediation. Uh, but of course, this is also very relevant to mold remediation. So mo most of what we did was not so much in testing different types of vacuums, just like a product testing, but developing methods on how how we, we would look at the efficiency of respirators and trying to understand what goes on in, in different phases. So, so we, we did uh, develop a method where we looked at the, res the, the vacuum cleaner um, ba basically at different... We, we probed a vacuum cleaner. We purchased a bunch of vacuum cleaners and then drilled holes onto different parts and to see how, how does how does the particle concentration reduce or is it increasing at some points of the respirator? So that was um, kind of one part of the study. And then another, uh, the last one was looking at the pickup. So when pickup efficiency from the different surfaces so, and then uh, looking at um, different respirators. Uh, I'm talking about respirators, I'm meaning vacuum cleaners, uh, filter-based vacuum cleaners, cyclonic vacuum cleaners, and then water-based vacuum cleaners. I see. But and as you mentioned, this was done long time ago, so I, I don't know how relevant this is anymore for these vacuum cleaners have developed. This was published 2001 and 2002, so uh, more than 15 years ago. So these particular models that we use have probably developed much further since that time. Well, it's still interesting. What... Which seemed to work better, the filter type, the cyclone type? The, what were the three? It was filter type? Water-based. Water-based. Did, Water-based. Did, yeah, well, which... at, that, at that point, the models that were available, um, I would say the filter-based was, was more efficient, and especially if the filter was after the motor, because um, some models of vacuum cleaners had the filters, and then the motor was after that. So there was actually generation of small particles from the vacuum from the cleaner brush. motor itself. Right. Um, but cyclonic and water-based, those that we tested at that time, they some of them had problems of re-entrainment. So initially they worked fine, but once it got loaded, we would see re-entrainment of, of dust that was already collected coming, coming through. So where did you measure the particles? In the room? Or in, how, how did you do that? Well, we actually, when we probed the vacuum cleaner, we had aerosol instruments, direct reading aerosol instruments that give particle size, and, and those were used in the vacuum cleaner. And um, so we, we did not, most of these studies, we did not vacuum surface, but we had aerosol, aerosolization of the dust into the vacuum cleaner inlet and then measured with the direct reading particle instruments, multiple instruments that were operating side by side, 
simultaneously at different points of the vacuum cleaner to kind of understanding what happens uh, inside the vacuum cleaner. That's very interesting. Cliff and I want one of the problems we see within the industry is we don't have a good way of testing our HEPA vacuum cleaners to determine if they're doing what they're supposed to do and, and whether they need some maintenance or whether they're ready for a new filter. And it's very hard to do. It's hard to figure out how do you test that vacuum cleaner. So it's something that I'd love to talk to you more about, and I'm, I'm hoping we can get you up for a conference because that's when we, we hope to do some more of this testing. What about with respect to removal from different surfaces? Was there any any research on that at all? Um, yeah, there's this one study, and I, I just opened this because I honestly I don't remember anymore what exactly we did and what we found. But we we looked at hard surface and carpet, and and this was again it was geared towards looking at what how how much do you have to do after you had let a pavement to get the lead, lead contaminated dust off the surface, mm-hmm. and and we did uh, I I, I re- recall we did ten sweeps on on the surface and for this we did uh, use um, household dust that was um, collected with um, uh, from from real real homes and then we sieved that and then we embedded the dust using ASTM standard for for embedding the dust with a like a metal metal tool on the surface and then we, with the direct reading instruments, we were able to continuously see what are we picking up. We put certain amount of dust on the surface, and then we weighed at the end the vacuum cleaner back to see how much did we pick it pick up from there. Ah, and okay. um, kind of, uh, let's see. So um, interestingly, when we did not even add any dust, we had new carpet directly from the or we actually um, had an increase in the dust bag. So we actually were vacuuming the fibers from the carpet <laughs> in mm. our control plank. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then when, when we embedded the different surfaces with the dust, then from vinyl hard surface, we were able to collect almost all the dust. So And that came in, in the first two sweeps, we pretty much got all the dust. On hard uh, surfaces? With the carpet, it, carpet, we had to, I think we did, 10 sweeps, like 10 times over that same surface. And just continuously, we were picking up, picking up dust. And at, after the 10 sweeps, we still had only 80% of the dust uh, picked up. So it was slower process, and not, or not everything was picked up with the vacuum. Very interesting, Dr. Rapone. And that's, that's interesting. We... Um I know you've got the wheels churning in, in both Cliff and uh, my minds here. I'm also seeing some text uh, comments. I'll get to those in just a moment. Cliff, any final thoughts on the or questions on the vacuum cleaners? No, I'm good, Joe. Thanks. All right. I think what we want to do is go to what we call a roundup here. Move them on, hit them up, hit them up. Move them on, move them on, hit them up, raw high. Cut them out, ride them in, ride them in, let them out, cut them out, ride them in, raw high. Okay, yeah, that's a good text we've got that Consumer Reports also tests VAX. Um, One of their important findings was that HEPA was not the only criterion. HEPA plus a warm motor, I think that says, equal poor performance. Also, some cheaper VAX work better than the expensive ones. Okay, well, we're going to follow up on that, and maybe we'll do a later show on that particular topic. I think it's a very important one for those doing this type of work. Um, okay, Cliff, any final questions from you? I, I, I want to get back to the green building study that um, I believe you're currently working on. But, Cliff, before I do, you, you want to uh, finish up with any questions? Um, I just had one really on, on microbiome. If you could uh, just comment quickly on the key determinants of uh, fungal and bacterial microbiome in homes. Key key determines. Uh, okay, so um, oh, that's a that's a. Uh, I think we we'll have a lecture on that. But briefly, <laughs> I would say outdoor air is is main thing that if you don't have 
any problems the outdoor air concentration the indoors especially the air concentration follows an outdoor so then we do have the indoor sources and and uh, mold, um, mold mold contaminated um, surfaces or any items that's once one source uh, we have seen that if um, the families have cats and dogs especially the dogs are dragging the, the um, fungi from outdoors to indoors um, there are other like fire food could be a source um, and any any mold contaminated if you get moldy sandwiches and you handle them that can release uh, mold uh, in the air um, I, I think is that what you were looking, looking that's, for? that's that fine question? perfect that's fine Joe Again, well, I'd like to finish well I've got two things I didn't realize I, I missed one earlier but um, you're doing some some research on green renovation and indoor air quality I wonder if you could tell listeners a little bit about what that study is about, and then what what you're finding. Oh yeah, so this this study we've actually finished the the most of it. It's still we are crunching up the results. Uh, the study that we had in Cincinnati is a part of a larger larger study on on green um, housing, and it's it's uh, spearheaded by Dr. Uh, Ginger Chu from CDC. Uh, we had in Cincinnati and Boston, we did a pilot for that study, basically for, uh, kind of had the first sites where we um, tested the sampling methods and all the, all the protocols. And then recently they had similar study where they have just finished the field sampling in New Orleans. So there have been three sites altogether, and I think they are looking for to be able to complete this in several other sites to be able to see uh, both um, how that a green renovation affects indoor air quality and children's asthma. So for children's asthma, definitely we need more more sites. In in Cincinnati, we had 50 sites. I think in all these three three places, we had 50 homes that we followed. Um, the goal was to do before the green renovation, then immediately after, and then six months after and 12 months after the renovation. And we looked at various indoor air components, particles, um, volatile organic compounds, pesticides, um, mold, uh, allergens, uh, and from indoor air quality perspective, and then from um, health, we looked at the asthma, asthma symptoms with different questionnaires and, and measurements of exhaled nitric oxide and lung function. Um, so just briefly in, in just looking at Cincinnati data because we have not yet had a like full um, cycle of looking at all the three sites but in Cincinnati what we found that generally we we did not see a big we had also co control site where there was no renovation going going on so between the renovated and then the control site we did not see big differences in any of these components actually the people affected the air quality more. What they did in the homes, they were burning candles and using cleaning um, agents and so on. That affected more than the green renovation. But within the homes that we were able to do before and then after the renovation, we, we did see uh, de decreases in certain um, components like um, uh, traffic-related particles, and that could be potentially affected by more tight buildings. So traffic particles were were uh, going into the indoor air less less than um, in people renovation when the, the buildings are not so tight. Could but this is still uh, ongoing. The data analysis is ongoing. Can you tell it's listeners uh, real quick what what is green renovation? What did that? Oh, what is yes. that? So uh, there are different ways to, decide, to, 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 to define that. For this, this was um, house, housing and urban development. Art had specific funding for, for, for low-income apartment communities to do renovation where you have certain features. You have to have certain features to be able to get uh, loan money, money um, for, for the renovation. In our case, there was um, low VOC emitting building materials, uh, they replaced the windows and doors. Um, they had new roofing. They insulated the house better. 
uh, there were exhaust fans uh, to the bathrooms and um, some other integrated pest management that is, is expected to reduce the pesticide exposure. So different features that are environmentally friendly and energy efficient, improving the energy efficiency I of see. the housing. Did they do air sealing? Um, and what did they do with the mechanical system, if anything? Um, the only thing that was done here was that they um, uh, in installed bathroom exhaust fans. They, they didn't have in that building those before. And then kitchen, kitchen had also exhaust fans. Hmm. They, um, they, did in, uh, they did change their windows and doors and sealed those more efficiently. Uh, I see. And, and what about the mechanical system, the HVAC? They didn't, doesn't sound like they did anything. Did they upgrade the filtration? No. no? Oh, the, the uh, furnaces were upgraded, but nothing else. Okay. All right, and and I've got one final so question. En- Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so more energy efficient furnace. All, basically, all the appliances were replaced with more energy efficient appliances. Okay, I, I want to know. You know, you you've been a part of this IAQ world for many years now, and um, I'm sure you keep an eye on what emerging issues uh, people should be concerned about. What what kind of emerging issues do you have your eye on? And we've already talked about a few, I guess, the the fragments and some of the other. Uh, yeah. Any others we should be keeping an eye out for? Um, well, I, I think uh, something that is up and coming to the, any, the exposure assessment in general is are the sensors, the use of sensors. And uh, so that's something that I am following myself keenly and with using already some of the sensors in our air quality studies. But... Nothing yet for bioaerosols, uh, at, at least I haven't seen, other than the direct reading instruments, but they are not in, in, a, in a way of not yet sensors. They are not small small that you can just put on your lap and, and wear like a smoke detector. But I, that's something that I am I'm myself um, keeping my eye on is the sensors and development different types of sensors for new, new types of other pollutants. I see. And a lot of these are low-cost sensors. I'm, I'm looking at two on my desk. We did a show with a guy who developed Fubot, and then we did a show with the folks from CMU that developed the spec. Both of those do uh, particulate, and the Fubot has some VOC in it as well. Is that the type of sensors you're talking about? Yes, yes, exactly that. And, and so keep an eye also on any testing results, because it's not like if you just attack develop, but it's it, should be validated properly before before really uh, starting to use. And before we go, first, thank you so much. It, I've been trying to line this interview up for years now. I'm just so glad you made it and we finally got a chance to talk. Is there anything you'd like to add before we go? Uh, well, I just want to uh, give, a, give a shout on that there's an international indoor air conference in Philadelphia in june 2018 so hopefully everybody is putting that in their calendar and i hope to see everyone in that conference i didn't know that june and that, that, in philadelphia that's the East, in, yeah in philadelphia wow and that's the international society for indoor air quality and climate is that their conference yeah that's that's correct fantastic that's great i'm glad to hear that i will definitely see you there but i'm hoping we'll see you much sooner than that dr tina rapone and thanks so much for joining us today on iaq radio thanks for having me our pleasure this is radio joe hughes saying thanks again to our guest this week dr rapone out of the university of cincinnati um, wonderful to meet some of her. Uh, Dr. Grinspa was also at the uh, conference I was at uh, in, in Boulder, Colorado, the microbiology, the indoor environment. His name was on a lot of these papers. I hope to get him on sometime. I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man. You came up with some papers that I missed, Cliff. Uh, well done, as always. Uh, at the controls, our engineer, John, you got to have faith. Most importantly, our growing group of loyal listeners come back next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reed saying thanks for listening. <laughs>